Welcome everyone to lecture number one of our Biology 1010 course lecture series. Um, this lecture is going to cover the scientific study of life. Um, what is life? How do scientists decide what is living and what's not living? Um, how do we define life? What are the traits of living organisms that are used to say this is alive versus this is not? Um, how do scientists answer questions? Some of the things that science can and can't answer. Um, and how we group life together um, in groups uh, like domains and kingdoms. So let's go ahead and get started with that. So if you've probably seen, just looking around through your daily life, um, living organisms are everywhere on the planet. Trees, dogs, birds, bacteria, um, pretty much everywhere you look. But there are some things out there um, that kind of bridge the gap between living and non-living on a surface level, things like viruses. Um, they do a couple of things that living organisms do, but not all of them. So those things can be very difficult to say, oh, you're alive um, and, or not alive, um, where it's easy as something like a rock where you can look at and go, oh, that rock is clearly not alive. Um, and you can look at things like our little mouse down here and go, oh, that mouse is clearly a living organism. Um, but things like viruses, um, prions, different things like that, um, which we'll talk about later on, kind of bridge the gap between living and not living organisms. So scientists have to come up with a step, um, a set of protocols and things like that um, to determine what is living and what is not living um, so we can classify it um, as a living organism or not. So anything that is a living organism, which we'll talk about how we classify those in just a second, um, is going to be studied in the field of biology. Um, biology is the study of life. Um, so all living organisms are going to be studied by biologists. There are lots of different types of biologists. There are microbiologists, um, ornithologists, ichthyologists, botanists, paleontologists, things like that, um, that study different forms of life. Um, ancient organisms, extinct organisms, currently living, microscopic, um, all different types of biology um, and biologists can be found out there. But they will all be studying some form of living organism. Well, what is a living organism? Well, every single living thing on the planet um, is its own little distinct form of life. This little mouse here um, is a living organism. It does everything that it needs to do to be considered living. It's one little living organism, um, and that's what we're going to consider an organism, an individual that's in full control um, of its body, full control of its actions and things like that. An organism, one little succinct um, living being right here. So what is life and how do we classify life? Well, life can be broken down um, into the basic unit of life, which is considered a cell. Now this cell here um, does everything that every other living organism on the planet can do, regardless of if you're one single cell, unicellular, or multicellular, made up of more than one cell. So cells are capable of doing all of the characteristics of life, which we'll talk about in just a second. Now, this multicellular organism over here is made up of a bunch of different cells that can all do the same thing. This one cell here is capable of living by itself, reproducing, eating, carrying on all of the characteristics of life just by itself, um, whereas all of the living organisms that are here, all of the cells inside of this one living organism are capable of doing the same thing. So we'll talk about what those different characteristics are um, and what decides living versus not living and things like that. So from the get-go, um, organisms can be broken down into unicellular, which means they're made up of one singular cell that's capable of doing all of the traits of life, or multicellular, which means they have more than one cell that all work together to make this one organism work as a whole. So all the cells inside of this mouse here are capable of doing everything that a unicellular cell can do. They just work together to make this mouse as a whole organism instead of living by themselves as a unicellular organism. So every single organism on the planet also has DNA. And this is one of the characteristics of life. We'll talk about that in just a little bit, um, a little more complex, a little more in depth. Well, DNA, as you probably know, um, is the molecule that carries genetic information from generation to generation. Um, this is going to be the textbook, the recipe, if you like, on how to make a new human, how to make a new mouse, how to make a new plant, a new fish, a new bacteria, 
um, and things like that. So when an organism reproduces, one copy of the DNA comes from the mother and one from the father. Or if you're an asexual reproducing organism, you get your own copy. Um, and that DNA is going to contain all of the information that's going to be needed to make a brand new organism uh, that's like similar to its parents. Now this DNA here is going to be the recipe, which is going to be used to make the food, the proteins, which will be assembled to make the dish as the human. So the DNA is the recipe, the proteins are going to be the things like the chicken, all of the rice, this different types of sauces and things like that. Um, the recipe tells you how to make all of those, so the DNA is the recipe on how to make proteins. Um, once you get all of the proteins assembled, all of the chickens cooked, all of the pastas cooked, all of the sauces are assembled, you mix them all together um, and you assemble them properly and then you make a cell or a living organism. And that's kind of how this works. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. So DNA is used to make the proteins, which are used to make the uh, more complex um, cells, the more complex uh, things inside of a cell which eventually lead to an organism as a whole. So how do we decide what is living and what is not living? Now once again it seems very easy on the surface level. You can look at things like rocks and go, oh that rock isn't alive. Um, trees, it's very easy to determine that they're living. You can see them growing, you can see them um, uh, change their colors and things like that, produce flowers, whereas a rock never really changes. So how do we really decide on a scientific level um, what's living and what's not. Now, if you recall, things like viruses and prions and things, they can do some of the traits of life which we're about to talk about, but not all of them. And that makes them very difficult. So scientists have come up with a set of characteristics um, that life has to have to be considered a living organism. Every single living organism on the planet is going to share all of these sets of characteristics, all of these traits of life. If you are a living organism, you have all of these traits. You could have four, five, three, two, one, but if you don't have all of them, you are not going to be considered a living organism. You must have every single trait to be considered a living organism. Um, you, uh, once again, a rock uh, may have one or two of the characteristics that we'll talk about in just a second, but it lacks all of them which rules it out of being a living organism. So every single living organism on the planet fulfills all of the traits that we're about to go over. So here they are right here, the five characteristics of life. Organization, energy, internal consistency, reproduction, growth and development, and evolution. So let's go ahead and talk about what each one of these things are, what they mean, um, and what they mean for life. So life on Earth is organized, and this is the chart of organization um, for cells. And then once you get past the cellular level, on the biological scale level, and we're talking about things like populations and ecosystems and globes and planets and things like that. So life on Earth starts at the smallest level of non-living things called matter. Now matter is just space. It takes up space. It just occupies existence. So anything that exists is going to be made up of matter. Um, that's kind of a hard concept to understand, but matter is just stuff. Now if you take some stuff and you cram it all together, um, you get an atom. And this is where we're going to start our journey, um, up the level of evolving complexity. And this is what this is called, going from simple things like matter all the way up to things like biosphere, the evolving levels of complexity. And this is what this is called. So at the very beginning, we have things like atoms. You take some matter, you shove it all together, a bunch of stuff, um, and you get an atom. Now this atom here is the most pure, the smallest version of something um, that we can define as something, something like gold. You can look at gold, um, and it's got every single characteristic that gold has, and there's nothing else on the planet um, that has exactly the same characteristics of gold. Now, gold is made up of atoms that are all the same, unique to gold. Each gold atom is identical to the atom next to it. Um, that's what makes gold gold. Now, things like neon, boron, all the different types of atoms out there are all different from each of the other unique types of atoms. Now, all the boron atoms are the same. 
all the nitrogen atoms are the same, all the helium atoms are the same for the most part, um, but they are all distinctly different from one another. And that uniqueness between them, those unique characteristics of hydrogen, helium, neon, and gold, and things like that, are what makes an atom an atom. You break apart a gold atom, um, you can do this in a lab, um, it's no longer gold. It's not going to be gold anymore. It's going to be something else if it stays together at all. It may just crumble into a oblivion. Now, if you break that gold atom apart, it's no longer gold anymore. It's not a pure gold element anymore. It's not a pure atom anymore. It's lost its existence. It's being, its form, it is no longer gold. It's something else, um, if it's anything at all. It may revert back to the matter form by that part. It might just kind of fall apart. So that's what's going on here. Atoms are the simplest version of a pure substance. You can't get any smaller than one atom of gold. If you take a bunch of atoms of gold and you stick them together, you get a pure element of gold. Now, if you take some atoms um, and you stick them together with different types of atoms, so uh, one gold atom and maybe a silver atom, or in this case, it would be a nitrogen atom, a couple of phosphorus atoms and things like that, um, you cram those all together in a unique way. Um, they're joined together in a, a little recipe, which is determined by your DNA, or chemical bonding and things like that, depending on what we're talking about here. Um, in this case, it's DNA. It's going to be assembled um, using chemical bonds and things like that um, that are unique properties of the atoms. So you take a couple of atoms, you cram them together, and you get a molecule, a joined group of atoms. Now this molecule can usually serve a purpose. This DNA here, as we've talked about, is going to be the uh, um, recipe that's going to build a new human, a new mouse, a new squirrel, whatever it is. Um, and this DNA here is going to contain information. So molecules are more useful than atoms. If you take a couple of molecules that all do work, molecules can usually do things, um, in the case of biology, things like DNA, things like a phospholipids and things like that, large molecules. And if you take a couple of molecules um, that can do work, that can do things that are structural, um, things like that, that build body parts and things or uh, cell parts, and you cram them all together, you're going to get an organelle. And this is going to be a uh, subunit of a cell, um, a little cellular organ, if you like. They don't really have organs. It just kind of functions like one. It just kind of works like your heart or like your liver. A little small um, contained unit um, that has a defined function. So your heart is meant to uh, drive blood around. Um, now, in this case, an organelle is a cellular version of an organ. Um, in this case, we're looking at a chloroplast. And its sole function is to make energy via photosynthesis. So... Um, you take the molecules, you stick them together, different types of molecules. You can see here the different colors, different shapes and things, different types of molecules. And they all form together to form uh, uh, an organelle, something that can do work, um, that has a specific function inside of a cell. Now, not every cell on the planet has organelles inside of it. We'll talk about some of that later on in this lecture series. Now, you take a bunch of organelles. Um, and you cram them all together, different types of organelles. This would be like having an organelle for your heart, a different type of organelle that does something else inside of the cell for waste would be like a, your bladder, your kidneys, your liver, things like that. Um, so different types of organelles. And you put those all together in one little unit, and you get a cell. This would kind of be like having the pizza sauce um, and the pepperonis um, and the, uh, the cheese and the bread crust, the pizza crust all over here is atoms. You put all of that stuff together, um, you get um, uh, a pizza. You start to bake all the, you got the organelles, you put them all together, you get a pizza dough. You throw the pizza in the oven, and you bake it all together as an organelle, and then you put all that stuff together and you get a big pizza. So all the individual little pieces build up on top of one another to make a functional cell, a functional unit of life. So cells, you can break them down into smaller units, the um, organelles, which do work. This is like your organs, your heart, your liver, and things like that. Um, cells have the same. There are versions of hearts, that uh, livers, and things. Now, they're not really hearts and livers, um, but they just do work inside of the cell. They function like organs for the cell. We'll talk about what all of these organs do um, later on in this lecture series. Now, not every single cell inside of it is going to have organelles. 
Um, there are two different types of cells, eukaryotic and prokaryotic. We'll talk about that later. Eukaryotic cells have organelles, whereas prokaryotes do not. So you take a couple of cells and you stick them all together, um, cells that are the same. You stick them all together and you're going to get a tissue. Now a tissue is going to be defined as a specialized collection of cells that do all the same thing for a specific function. So in your case, um, your skin would be a tissue. All of the cells inside of your skin are going to be epithelial cells, which all do the same purpose, which all look the same, they form the same, they reproduce the same, um, they're all attached the same. And the reason for that is because you need your skin to do the same thing all across your entire body. So all of your skin cells are going to be the same, making your skin tissue to allow your body to function as it should, to have the skin function as it should. Now over here, you can see inside of our uh, tissue here, inside of our leaf, we're working on a plant. Um, each one of these plant cells you can see inside of here, the little uh, rectangles, little squares with the dots and the nucleus, all the little squares and things. Um, all of these little individual cells are all plant cells. They all do pretty much the same thing. They pretty much all look the same. They're pretty much all built the same. And they all function together um, to coordinate this leaf working as a leaf. Um, you have to have all of these cells together doing the same thing to make this leaf function as it should. Now, if you take all of the different types of tissues inside of that leaf, you're going to have um, mesothelial tissue or uh, um, epithelial tissue um, that has a waxy cuticle on it to prevent water loss. You're going to have mesophilic tissue that conducts photosynthesis and things like that inside of the leaf. You take all of these different types of tissues and you stick them together and you're going to get an organ. Now in our case, you can take the tissues of your liver. Um, inside of your liver, all of the tissues that function to make your liver are the same. They all are going to pretty much do the same thing. Um, and you take all of those tissues, the liver tissues, and you stick them together and you get the liver organ. And that's going to be specialized tissues all grouped together that interact, that carry out one specific function. So your liver is meant to remove waste products and toxins and things from your blood. Um, and in this case, a plant leaf is meant to make energy via photosynthesis for the plant as a whole. Now, if you take all of the different organs um, inside of an organism, now in this case, all of the different leaves that produce energy, and in our case, if you take your liver, you group it with your kidneys, your heart, your lungs, all of the different other organs that you have that do things, um, to allow you to live, and you group them together, you're going to get an organ system. Now this is going to be the organs that interact with one another. So not all of your organs interact with one another. Um, your liver doesn't really interact with your lungs, but your liver is going to interact with your circulatory system to get the blood um, that it needs to filter. It's going to interact with your kidneys, your excretion system, and things like that. So all of the different organs that interact with one another are going to form an organ system. Now in this case, the organ system of our tree here is going to be all of the leaves that produce photosynthesis, uh, or produce uh, energy and food for this tree via photosynthesis, I should say. Now if you take all of the different organ systems inside of the organism, and this would be things like your respiratory system that includes your lungs, your trachea, and things like that, um, your circulatory system, your heart, your bloodstream, um, your reproductive system, your excretion system, your um, things like that, your epithelial system, all of the different types of organs that you have inside of you, all of the different organ systems you have, and you group them all together, you're going to get a living organism. And this is what biology is going to start um, looking at the study of life as the organismal level. Now, biologists will study all of the things below it. There are cellular biologists, um, there are organismal biologists, there are um, all different types of biologists. But for our class, we're really going to start um, at the organismal level when we start talking about animals and things. We'll cover the organelles, the different types of molecules, how they work, um, but we'll start at the organismal level um, for our animals and things like that, the classification levels. So all of the organ systems working together, um, this would be like your car or the engine, all uh, the tires, the transmission, everything, the fuel system has to work together to make a fully functional car. 
um, a fully functional organism is going to have fully functional organs and systems, which have fully functional organs, which have fully functional tissues, which have fully functional cells, which have fully functional or organelles inside, which have fully functional uh, molecules, which have fully functional atoms that make them up. And this is the cellular level of organization for life. Now, you can go a step higher than this when we start talking about organisms as a group, more than one organism. Um, so we're going to start taking those individual organisms and grouping them together in more than one type of living organism. They may be the same species or different species, um, because as you probably well know, different types of animals interact with one another multiple times. Different species throughout the day will come in contact with other different species. And all of those different interactions are going to influence how an organism evolves, how it adapts, how it lives, um, what its behaviors are and things throughout the day. So you have to organize life higher than just the organism itself. So let's talk about how we do that. You take an individual, um, this tree here, in this case it's an acacia tree, they're found in Africa. Um, all of the acacia trees in a given area, so let's take the uh, state of, or the country of uh, South Africa. All of the acacia trees in the country of South Africa are going to make up a population of acacia trees, a unique interbreeding group of organisms that are all living in the same place at the same time. And that's the key here. Um, a group of acacia trees that's found in North Africa, um, five, six thousand miles away from South Africa, is not going to be able to interact, to interbreed, to ever come in contact with acacia trees that live in South Africa. So they don't really matter. They're not going to influence one another at all. But the acacia trees that live around them in the same vicinity, it's very likely that they will interbreed, um, they'll interact with one another, they will have some sort of species interaction. So that's what's going to define them as a population. The same species that's occupying the same geographic area at the same time. And that's the key for a population here. They have to be at the same place and the same time. So you can see down here, we've got multiple acacia trees in the same area. Now, as you probably know, there are multiple species that live at, in the wilderness, in the wild, at the same time. This is Africa. Um, there are lots and lots of other animals that live in Africa. Um, elephants, in our example here, lots of grass. It's a living organism, too. Um, birds, there's lots of different wildebeest, zebras and things like that, and palha, lots of lions and stuff. So all of those different animals that live together, all the groups of them are going to be individual populations. All the lions in South Africa are going to be a population. All the elephants are going to be a population. All the acacia trees are going to be their own separate population. But all of those organisms interact at some point in time. Whether they mean to or not, um, they will be forced to interact with one another. Now those interactions, all of those living organisms that will interact, all the different populations of living organisms, make up a community. And this is going to be all the different populations of animals that live in the same place at the same time. Make up a community. All of the living organisms in one area. All the different populations at one spot. Now, as you probably also know, Non-living things, things like heat, um, things like drought and water, things like um, lightning strikes, um, all of that stuff can also influence how animals and organisms live in their environment. Um, it can cause fires that kill things, it can cause uh, droughts which cause organisms to not have food and they die from starvation or water loss and things like that, dehydration. So you have to take into account how the non-living factors of an organ, uh, environment, how an organism's environment, influence the living organisms that live there as well. So when you do that, you take all of the different populations, the individual species group, you group them together with all of the different species there, and then you take into account all of the environmental factors, the non-living things, that's often called abiotic, uh, biology, biotic meaning living, abiotic meaning non-living, a without, the biotic meaning living. You take all of those non-living factors and you group them in there as well. You get an ecosystem. Now as you probably also know, ecosystems interact with one another as well as a whole. 
things that happened in Africa, if you recall. Um, we have had uh, things like the Sahara Desert uh, sands that have come over to the United States before. Um, we're nowhere near the Sahara Desert, but what happens in the ecosystem in the Sahara influences the ecosystem in the United States. Um, so ecosystems interact with one another as well. So you have to take that into account. And when you start grouping in all of the ecosystems together, you get something called a biosphere, a global ecosystem. All of the interacting um, ecosystems that include all of the communities, all of the populations, all of the individual species on the earth grouped together, you get a biosphere. And this biosphere makes life possible on the planet. All of these things interacting with one another create a very finely balanced planet which allows life on earth to thrive. Now, as we move up the level of uh, um, evolving cellular uh, complexity, evolving complexity, um, each level you go up from organs to organelles to organ systems to organ uh, organisms and things like that, um, you get something called an emergent property. Now, an emergent property is something that an individual cell or an individual trait cannot do. But when you group them together, they can form something, something that's greater than itself. Um, and that's kind of a very interesting concept. So in this case, um, a brain cell, an individual singular cell, um, cannot form memories. It cannot cause thoughts. It can't cause the body to move. It can't power your heart. But if you take a bunch of brain cells that are all individual brain cells that are all the same, and you group them together and they start to interact with one another, you get the ability to form thoughts. You get the ability to cause cellular actions and things like that. And when you group all of these interacting brain cells together, you get a brain, which is capable of powering an organism. The interacting brain cells cannot power an organism. The brain cell itself cannot make thought. But if you go up each level, you get an emergent property, something that the level before could not do. But when you group it together, it can. Now, in this case, our brain is capable of doing something great, forming memories, forming thoughts, um, causing actions. All of these interacting brain cells um, cause the brain to have an, the emergent property of memory, of thought, of uh, foresight, and things like that that the individual brain cell as itself cannot do. And that's what the uh, concept of levels of biological organization are, building up to allow things to become more complex, to al uh, allow them to do greater um, sums of work, greater things than they could do at the level before. So that's the level of organization, um, how organization works. Um, and what organization is, how life is organized, and that's our very first characteristic of life. Life on Earth is highly organized. Now, life on Earth is highly organized, but there are also things out there like rocks and viruses that are organized as well. They can't do the rest of this stuff. They're organized. Crystals, if you've ever seen a crystal under a microscope, are very highly organized in their structures, the way they're put together. But they can't make energy. They can't reproduce, and they can't evolve. And that's what rules them out of being living organisms. You have to have, as I said earlier, all five of these traits to be considered a living organism. So if you don't have all five, you're not a living organism, even though you may have one or two or three of them. So our next trait of life is the ability to produce energy or obtain energy from the environment. Life on Earth is the only thing that can obtain and use energy. Now, what is energy? Um, energy is often defined as the ability to do work, do things inside of a cell, um, so uh, to power life itself. Now, why do we need energy? Well, energy is used to keep you organized. You have to make those organs. You have to make those organ systems. You have to make those organelles. You have to make new DNA. You have to put them together in the right order. I'm glad you've got all the 2 by 4s and the drywall to make your house, but if you don't have the energy to put it together, it's not really going to do you a lot of good. So that's what energy does inside of a cell, and that's why we need it. Energy is also going to allow you to break down the food that you eat 
to build up the uh, byproducts of that breaking down that food into more complex uh, things that your body's going to use to power chemical reactions and things inside of your body. Without the ability to break down the stuff that you eat to get the energy out of it, you would not be able um, to power your body, to power the machinery that keeps you running. Um, energy allows you to transport waste um, out of your cells. Um, it also allows you to uh, your cells to move things inside the cell that they may need, the little nutrients and stuff that they find floating around in your bloodstream or inside of your body. Um, it also allows your immune system um, to eat um, things like bacteria um, and things that they find inside of your body that could potentially cause you to be sick. Sorry about that. Um, it also allows uh, cells to move materials between themselves. Um, sometimes they can send hormones um, from cell to cell or, or cellular material energy and things from cell to cell. Um, what it also does is it allows organisms um, energy to maintain their internal consistency. Um, things like homeostasis, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, when you get cold, you shiver to warm yourself up. When you get hot, you sweat to cool yourself down. Um, and all of that takes energy. Um, without the energy to make yourself shiver, you would freeze to death. Um, so you need energy to allow yourself to keep your body temperature warm. And not only that, you need energy to keep your life going as a species. You need energy to form sperm to feed your baby. You need uh, energy to grow a, a developing baby and things like that. Um, you need energy to produce an egg. Um, now, once you're born, um, you need energy to continue growing, or once you're even developing for that matter. Um, you need energy to do both of those things. Um, if you didn't have energy, you would not grow larger. You would stay as an infant forever, a little baby. Um, your body would never get larger. You would never fully develop into an adult capable of reproducing which is the entire point of life on Earth from a biological perspective, to pass your genes on to the next level. So energy um, and getting energy is all about, um, life is all about that, getting energy and using it for these things right here. Um, and life on Earth is the, about the only thing that's capable of obtaining energy um, in this kind of sense. It's capable of doing this. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So how do we get energy, and how is energy classified in a biological sense? Well, all energy on the Earth the, uh, comes from the sun. Sunlight is the source of all energy on the planet. Now, sunlight is going to travel great distances from our sun. It takes about eight and a half minutes um, from sunlight to leave the sun to reach planet Earth. Um, so if the sun ever goes out, we have about eight minutes to know, um, and then we'll find out. Um, after about eight minutes after it's gone out. Well, anyway, after it makes its little journey from the sun, or its long, long journey, I should say, from the sun to the earth, it's going to hit a plant. Now, if you know anything about plants, you know that they are photosynthetic. They have the ability to use the sun's light to produce energy. And that is a key characteristic of life here. They produce energy. Life makes energy. Now, life on earth is um, the energy that powers all living organisms is going to come from plants. This cellular energy, this light energy here, solar energy, excuse me, from the sun, is completely useless to things like this beetle here, things to these plant, uh, this fungus, these mushrooms, things to us. We cannot use solar energy. Plants, however, can. They will take this solar energy, it will hit their leaves, um, their leaves will carry out photosynthesis, which produces sugar, um, which then is going to be uh, consumed by the plant to power um, its own self to grow, to reproduce for the plant, and things like that. Now, what's also going to happen is this plant is going to produce too much sugar, too much food for itself sometimes. Now, when it does, um, it's going to store that food away um, inside of itself as a fruit or something like that. And that can be eaten for a source of energy um, for other organisms. Now, when they don't produce all that extra energy, sometimes they just get eaten themselves. Um, and all that energy that they've produced is going to be stored inside of their leaves, or in the case of an animal, stored inside of its meat, its muscles, and things like that. And when something eats the plant, it's going to eat the energy that's stored inside of that leaf. So this little beetle here is eating the plant leaf, and this beetle cannot make energy from the sun, but this plant made energy from the sun, 
And all that energy from the sun is now inside of this leaf. And when the beetle eats the leaf, he's going to get the energy from that leaf that the plant produced. So without the plant, this beetle would not have any, any um, energy, could not get any energy because he can't get energy from the sun. He's not photosynthetic. So plants are considered something called a primary producer. They are capable of taking sunlight and some nutrients from the soil and turning that into energy which can power life on Earth. And that's pretty cool. Now every single time that life on Earth takes energy and converts it from sunlight or into energy or energy inside of a plant into energy inside of a bug um, and things like that, that some of that energy is going to be lost in the form of heat. Now that most of the energy, something like 90%, is the usable energy is going to be lost to the environment via heat. It takes energy to make energy. It takes energy to power the machinery that run the cells inside of this guy to keep them alive. It takes energy inside of the plant to grow. It takes energy inside of the plant to maintain itself staying upright to get more nutrients from the soil. It takes energy to maintain life. Now, the energy that the sun's going to get, 90% of that energy is going to go to power the plant or just simply lost as heat through respiration um, as this plant produces oxygen and, uh, um, and produces ATP for itself. Um, so most of the energy that's um, capable of being used is going to be lost, and that's very unfortunate. Now, what's going to happen is this beetle here is going to eat the plant, and when he eats the plant, 90% of the energy from the plant is also going to be lost to the beetle. So he's going to have to power his body here. He's going to have to fly around to get to the plants. He's going to have to digest all the stuff he eats. He's going to have to reproduce. It takes energy to make energy. So most of the energy inside of that beetle is also going to be lost as heat. When he eat, or most of the energy inside the leaf, excuse me, that's available to the beetle is going to be lost as heat. Now eventually what will happen is this beetle will die and the nutrients that are inside of him are going to be recycled into the earth um, back into the system through uh, organisms called decomposers. Now, our primary producers take sunlight and make energy from that. A consumer is going to eat a primary producer. That primary producer is going to have the energy inside of it go to the consumer. That consumer will eventually die, and the nutrients that are trapped inside of that consumer will then be decomposed by a decomposer and then recycled back into the process, into the cycle system here. So the decomposers are things like bacteria, fungus, and things like that. Um, when this organism dies, they will break down the components inside of him. Um, they will break down his little body um, and digest all of the goodies inside of him um, and recycle that stuff back into the soil. And then when this fungus dies, it will die and be digested into the soil as well. And then all of the nutrients that were inside of that beetle are now going to be available inside of the soil, just kind of floating around there. And then plants can suck up all of the nutrients that they need from that dead beetle um, that's been recycled back into the soil by our decomposers to make more energy to power the cycle again. So plants, our primary producers, power the entire energy system here. So energy is the second characteristic of life, the ability to make and use cellular energy. Now all life on Earth, our next characteristic, is capable of maintaining internal consistency. Now there are lots of different types of internal consistency, and I'll talk about some in a second, but that as itself is known as homeostasis, the process in which a cell or an organism maintains internal consistency. Now you're probably familiar with quite a few of these examples, and you can probably come up with more than I'm going to list here. But if you run and you get quite hot, you know your body starts to sweat. All of that sweat is going to be evaporated from your body into the environment. Now what's happened is your body has gotten hot. The internal temperature has raised higher than 98.6 on average for most people. And the body goes, oh, I'm getting warm. I don't need to be warm. I don't function well at this high temperature. I need to cool myself down. So that registering of that high temperature change is going to cause your body to start producing sweat. 
Now that sweat is going to be evaporating off of you, cooling your body down back to 98.6 degrees. And once you reach 98.6 degrees, the body will go, oh, I'm happy now again, and it will send out another signal that says to stop sweating. There's no need to get any cooler. Another example um, here would be water. When your body feels like it's dehydrated, um, it's thirsty, it sends out a signal that says, hey, I need more water. Drink something to bring me back up to the um, level of, of hydration that I would like to be at. You drink some water, um, you get rehydrated, your body then sends out another signal that says, oh, I don't need any more water, um, and things like that. Another example that you're probably familiar with is shivering. Um, you get cold outside, it's quite cold. Your body goes, oh, it's too cold for me out here. I don't like living in 60, 50 degree weather, 40 degree weather. I'm going to die if I maintain this temperature, if my internal body temperature drops to, uh, I think it's about five or six degrees, um, you can die, you can drop into hypothermia. So your body is going to register that change in temperature and start to shiver. Now that shiver is going to cause your cells to burn energy, which produces quite a bit of heat, if you recall from the little section earlier, um, just a second ago, about how uh, energy transfers work. Um, lots of that energy is lost as heat just through powering the body. So all of that heat that's going to be produced by shivering and uh, making your body move is going to warm your body back up. Um, in an attempt to keep you from freezing to death. So once your body reaches back up to 98.6, a good happy temperature, um, it will send out a signal that says, hey, there's no need to shiver anymore. You have reached uh, peak temperature. You can stop. So homeostasis is the ability to regulate your internal consistency um, and uh, how, to, how your body does that, sending out signals, um, hormones, and things like that. To tell your body what you need to do. Do you need to sweat to cool down? Do you need to shiver to warm up? Do you need to drink to get more hydrated? Um, and things like that. So there's quite a few of them. Um, a couple of the other examples would be things like uh, salt and sugar imbalances. Um, if you're diabetic or you know anyone that's diabetic, um, they have to balance the sugars inside of their body because they don't produce insulin um, or they may have an insulin deficiency. Now insulin is going to be how your body regulates sugar. It's, you get too much sugar, your body's going to produce insulin, which will, hope, uh, which will help sequester away that sugar so your blood sugar doesn't go extremely high. Too high of blood sugar is not a good thing. Also, too low is a bad thing. When you start to get too low of blood sugar, your body starts to shiver. Um, you get shaky, you get blurry vision and things like that, and you can eventually pass out. Salt is the same thing. Too much salt or too little salt, um, your body's start to, going to start craving salt or craving water. Um, to dilute that salt down or to get more salt back into your system. You have to have the right amount of salt, sugar, nutrients, and things for your body to function properly. Um, and homeostasis is how your body keeps that process, keeps those levels consistent. So life is the only thing on the planet that is capable of doing homeostasis. A rock, if you put it out in the, the yard, is going to be 110 degrees during the summer. It's going to be 30 degrees and covered with snow in the winter. Um, it does not have the ability to shiver, to warm itself up, or to sweat to cool itself down. It is whatever temperature it is, regardless of where it is and what time. Life on Earth also has the ability to reproduce, to make a new copy of itself. This is the entire point of life from an evolutionary biological perspective. To pass on your genes to make a new copy of yourself so your species can persist and you as a species do not go extinct. Now there are two different types of reproduction and you're probably familiar with these as well. Asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. So asexual reproduction um, is going to take place when one parent makes an identical cloned copy of itself with no uh, sex, no uniting of gametes, um, no exchange of genetic information at all. So this little strawberry plant here, you can see it's growing out little uh, runners that will grow new strawberry plants along the runners. So you can see the little strawberry plants starting here. Each one of these little strawberry plants is genetically identical, it's a clone, to this original strawberry plant that it came from. Now this is really an interesting strategy for reproduction. 
Um, it's very fast. You don't need to find a mate. You don't need to worry about um, if the environment um, it has, if you, you don't have to find a mate. You don't really need to worry about um, gestation periods. You don't need to worry about um, caring for your offspring. You just have a bunch of them. They're all the same, and you can make them at any time you want to. And it works really well when the environment doesn't change. If everybody, all of these strawberry plants are identical to one another, if a disease comes into this uh, population of plants, this field, all of the plants are the same, one of these plants gets the disease, there's a very likely, uh, very highly chance that almost all, if not all, of the other plants are also going to get that disease. They're all the same. If there's a genetic defect inside of this plant as well, which causes it to produce poor strawberries, all of its identical asexually produced offspring will also have that same defect. So this is kind of a risky strategy as well. If the environment, if uh, this plant is adapted to survive in a very, um, what, very uh, wet, very uh, watery environments, it rains a lot here, um, and then all of a sudden the environment starts to get a little drier, there's no genetic variability in this population. So all of the plants need a lot of water. There's not a single one of them that doesn't need a little bit of water. They're all going to die. This works really well when the environment is quite stable. Um, if a disease comes in, and all the, like I said, all the plants are the same, they're all going to be susceptible to that disease, they're all going to be susceptible to a drought, um, to a parasite, to a predator, they're all going to be the same. So when the environment is stable, and you don't really have to worry about a changing environment, um, this type of reproduction works extremely well. Now the other type of reproduction is sexual reproduction. Now sexual reproduction involves the uniting of gametes, or sperm and egg for the most part, um, of two different organisms. Um, so when this happens, the offspring that are produced are going to be genetically different than their parents. And this is the key here. So sexual reproduction, since you get genes from two different individuals instead of an identical clone, the offspring that are going to be produced are going to be 50-50 blends, are a little different, depends on how the genes shake up, we'll talk about that later, um, are going to be blends of both their mother and their father. So you can see down here our trumpeter swans, there's the male here, you can see that big knot on his head, our female over here. Their little offspring are going to be um, blends um, of both of them together. Um, so they're going to be a little bit like their dad and a little bit like their mom, but they're not going to be identical to either of them. Now, this is a very useful thing. If a disease comes in, dad might be susceptible to the disease, but mom might not, which means that both of their babies have a 50-50 shot of not being susceptible to that disease. So they might have inherited their gene from their mom, which makes them immune to a disease. Whereas had this organism reproduced asexually, all of the swans would die from that same disease. Another thing could happen. Um, the environment starts to get a little cooler here. Maybe this chick here is a little fluffier than his parents. Maybe both of their genes um, were slightly fluffy. He got more genes. He produces a little more feathers. Um, so he's a little better insulated than his parents. Um, so he can survive the cold a little better than his parents. So his parents might die, but he won't, which means their species is able to survive as a whole instead of dying out completely because of one disease or one environmental change. So organisms that produce sexually tend to be a little more adaptable um, in the environment to changes because they have genetic variability, genetic variation within their populations. Not everybody is a clone that's susceptible to the same diseases, or the uh, same um, environmental changes as everyone else inside of their population. So, life is the only thing on the planet that is capable of reproduction, growth, and development. Rocks don't reproduce. You break a rock in half, you get two rocks. It's never going to make another rock by itself. Rocks don't grow. Rocks don't really develop. Um, so, that's another characteristic of life. Reproduction, growth, and development. And our very last characteristic of life is the ability to evolve. 
Now evolution, we'll talk about this later on, is simply defined as the genetic change over time in a population of organisms. Um, a lot of people like to give this really complex uh, definitions, or the really simple one is survival of the fittest, um, which we'll talk about later, is not really a, an appropriate definition for evolution. It's not a really good definition. It just happens to be the um, popular and common lingo for evolution. Well, what evolution really is, is it's simply just a genetic change over time in a population. Now, bacteria, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, are a really good way to talk about evolution. It's simply just changing the genetic frequency or how often a gene shows up in an environment. And that's what evolution is. So you can see here we start out with a group of bacteria. All of these bacteria are green, which means they are all susceptible to um, a particular antibiotic. They're all going to die if you take an antibiotic, it's going to kill them. Now, if you give them enough time, bacteria mutate. It happens all the time. Mutations are, are random. Sometimes they're beneficial. Sometimes they're not. But given enough time, bacteria can sometimes evolve and mutate a resistance gene, a new gene which allows them to have a resistance to an antibiotic, which means they're not going to die if you take that antibiotic. So you can see this one little antibiotic-resistant bacteria right here, the one red one. So what's going to happen? Let's introduce our evolutionary uh, change here. So you start to take an antibiotic. Now what's going to happen if you don't take an antibiotic? If you don't take an antibiotic, this bacteria is just going to grow and grow and grow and grow. And this one little antibiotic-resistant bacteria right here is not going to have any pressure at all put onto him. The environment doesn't tell him that antibiotics are there. There's no need for him to be, he's not special at this point. It doesn't really matter that he's resistant to an antibiotic. So he's just going to chill. Everybody else is going to reproduce like normal, and they're going to have a very um, po a stable population that's full of mostly antibiotic, non-resistant bacteria, and maybe one or two resistant organisms. So let's introduce our antibiotic, and let's see what happens when we do that. So we introduce our antibiotic, and now what's happened is this guy right here isn't going to die. But these guys, the green ones, are. They're going to die when they come in contact with this antibiotic, whereas our antibiotic-resistant red bacteria will not. So we introduce our antibiotic, we give it a couple of days, and we come back and take a look at our bacteria. Now what's happened is this guy didn't die, so he was capable of asexual reproducing and producing more copies of himself. So he did that. Every single one of his offspring are also going to be red and capable of surviving in the presence of an antibiotic. Which means this entire population is going to be pretty much antibiotic resistant. Now there are going to be one or two, maybe a couple, of the original type that are not resistant to the antibiotic. And that's just how genes work. There's always going to be a little um, difference, a little variation in between these populations. If, if there's more than one gene, there's going to be a little difference. But you can see here the vast overwhelming majority of these bacteria are now going to be antibiotic resistance. And that makes sense if you think about it. The organisms that can uh, survive in the presence of antibiotics will do so. And they will reproduce um, whereas the organisms that cannot will die. When they reproduce, if their, or if their offspring can survive in the presence of their antibiotics, the same thing will happen. They will grow, they will reproduce, and they will produce more resistant antibiotic bacteria. Whereas if you can't, you're going to die, and you're not going to pass your genes on, which causes the population of non-resistant organisms to go drastically down. So this is just a little simple demonstration of evolution. We'll talk about it later on in this lecture series um, of how genetics can change over time. Um, and some it was a very simple example um, of what can cause that and uh, how to demonstrate it um, using bacteria. So why is it that somehow organisms seem perfectly in suited um, to the environments that they live in? Well, it's not necessarily that they evolve, that they're suited for it. Um, it just so happens that they just work well there. Um, evolution is not a magic wand. It doesn't have a goal. 
Um, it has no plan. It has no foresight. It just happens. Um, it doesn't mean to do anything. There's no thought behind it. It just happens. It's a random, totally random process. Now, this pygmy seahorse right here, um, as you probably know, there are multiple different species of seahorses, and this just happens to be one called the pygmy seahorse, and it blends in perfectly with the coral behind it. And this is the species of coral that this pygmy seahorse likes to live on. Now, this pygmy seahorse did not evolve to fit perfectly within this um, this uh, coral behind it. What happened is this pygmy seahorse just so happened to have genes which looked or blend, allowed it to blend in well with the coral around it. And what happened is when it started to blend in, it didn't get eaten. And the pygmy seahorses that blended in better didn't get it eaten either. So they all started to interbreed with one another, which eventually produced seahorses, which blend in extremely well. Now, they didn't choose to be camouflaged. Evolution didn't make them become camouflage. It just worked on the natural differences between the organisms that were out there. Now, there are lots of different species of seahorses, and not all of them look like this. That one, uh, this species, just happens to have evolved this way. Different species of seahorses that are green with a, um, or brown maybe, you know, probably have seen the leafy sea dragons. They evolved under different conditions where they had more leafy plants around them or different color plants and things like that. Whereas a, a pink seahorse would stand out against green leaves, um, the pink seahorses were eaten. Um, and the green seahorses, their genes allowed them to evolve uh, more camouflage um, over time. So we've already gone over our uh, example of resistant bacteria, um, in our resistance for antibiotics and bacteria, and how this is a little simple um, example of evolution. So this is our five key characteristics of life on Earth. Um, all life on Earth has to have these five characteristics to be considered living. Life on Earth can evolve. Life on Earth is capable of changing genetics over time. Um, all living organisms are influenced by environmental conditions, things like natural selection. Um, all living organisms undergo evolution as well. So these are our five characteristics of life. All living organisms must do all five of these. You can have four of them, but you are not living. You must have all five. So let's talk about how we organize life on a biological level. So scientists use something called taxonomy to classify living organisms into different groups. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are lots of different types of living organisms. There are bacteria, fungus, plants, animals, and things like that. Um, so how do we group together all of these different groups of living organisms into a smaller group so we're not overwhelmed with saying life itself? Um, so we can have smaller groups to study and groups to look at. Well, scientists will take different animals, different uh, plants, different organisms, and they will look at their DNA sequences, how their DNA is put together, how their proteins are put together. Um, what are some other things inside of their bodies, or how those things are put together, how their functions, how their bones are put together. Um, and then they're also going to look at just how they look, how they move, how they behave, um, what their environment's like to figure out how organisms are related to one another. Um, so when they do that, organisms that are related to one another are placed on a tree of life, the group of life, and you can see that over here. And we have animals and fungi and plants, um, and we have domains of life, which we'll talk about in just a second. So we're going to group our animals together based on how closely they are related to one another. So if we take our tree of life here, we can see down here this was the original living organism, some sort of primitive cell um, that arose about four point, about 3.7 billion years ago, somewhere around in there. Um, our primitive cells, the very first primitive cells, I think it's 4.2 to 3.7 billion years, um, our very first primitive cells arose. Well, anyway, once those primitive cells arose, they started to evolve and change um, because of different conditions found on the planet around them. So as we go up our life, um, our tree of life here, we had an, in, an evolutionary split, a change, where two different cell types um, evolved differently from one another. Something distinct happened here. 
um, one change occurred, it would be like our red bacteria, our green bacteria becoming red. A change occurred here where one bacteria group, the domain bacteria, evolved separately than one another. Um, and the group that changed, that went separately, evolved into something else. We'll talk about how all this stuff works later. But the farther you are away from other organisms, the less you are related to them. So animals and fungi are very far apart from bacteria, the domain bacteria. So we're not very closely related to bacteria or archaea and things like that. However, we are fairly closely related to fungi and plants um, and protist and things like that. The more closely the branches are um, apart, the more close they are apart, the closer related the organisms are to one another in an evolutionary time scale. And this is where the species branched, where the evolutionary lineage, where the family tree um, branched between the history of these two types of organisms here. Animals and fungi are plants and fungi, plants and protists and things like that. So, um, you can see the branches um, in a little more zoomed-in session. Um, and this is how we s determine um, how closely related organisms are to one another. So the closer the branches are, um, the more closely related an organism is. So you can see here we have a human and a kangaroo, and we have one branch between them. Now this is a very simplified tree. There's quite a bit more organisms that are actually on this tree. But you can also see over here we have a platypus. And that platypus comes down here to a branch down here. Well, that branch splits again right there into two different things. These kangaroo and a human are significantly closer together than the platypus over here. There's also less branches between them. There's one branch, two branches between a human and a platypus, but there's one branch between a human and a kangaroo. So humans are more closely related to kangaroos than we are platypuses. And we'll talk of this about, uh, about this kind of stuff a little later on in this lecture series as well. So life, once we start talking about animals, is organized onto eight different levels. Um, this is called the Domain, Kingdom, Phylum, Class, Order, Family, Genus, Species. Um, the little acronym I like to use for this is Danish Kings Play Cards on Fat Green Stools. Um, and this is the, little, uh, the easy acronym that I use to remember this. Now, what this means um, is it's going to be saying things like um, life on Earth. So life is a lot of stuff. There's a lot of living organisms. This would be like saying vehicle. Well, a vehicle can be everything from a train to a plane to a car to a boat. Um, so that's not really helpful. So that's like just like saying life. Well, we want to make it a little more, um, a little less complicated, a little more uh, simplified. So what scientists do is we classify life um, down different ways. So we go from saying vehicle um, to car. And this would be taking one step down to domain. So car can be a minivan, a truck, a Hummer, a semi-truck, a bus, things like that. Four wheels that drive. So that doesn't really help, but it eliminates buses or uh, um, boats, it eliminates trains, it eliminates uh, wagons and things like that. So we're taking a step down to get a little more inclusive. We're making a step down um, to get a little more inclusive so we can figure out what we're talking about. So in this case, in the animal world, we start off with life, and then we go to something called a domain, which we'll talk about in a second, what they are. Domain is like saying car. We've taken a step down. Now there's three different domains of life. We'll talk about them in a second. We take a step down to kingdom, and kingdom is like saying um, semi-trucks. So now we've gotten away from uh, pickup trucks and uh, sport utility vehicles, uh, semi, uh, sports cars and things like that, and we know that we're just talking about uh, semi-trucks. So in this case, we're talking about the kingdom Uca domain Eukarya. This excludes bacteria um, and archaic organisms. And we're in the kingdom Animalia. So just animals, no plants, um, no fungus, no protist, and things like that. So then we take a step down to the phylum level. And this is going to be saying things like um, uh, long haul uh, semi truck. So you've got to step down. You go from the little short haul semi trucks to a long haul semi truck, a large one. So just semi trucks, and you eliminate half of them. You get a little smaller characteristics. So this would be chordata for humans. 
And these are things with the backbone. The next one would be class, one more step down, where you're talking about Peterbilt trucks. Um, and this would be mammalia. So mammals, you've excluded fish, you've excluded reptiles, you've excluded birds. Um, and now you're down into the order. And this would be like saying um, what size engine it has and what body style truck you have. Now we're on to primates for our biological example here. Um, this excludes everything that's not some sort of um, monkey, uh, monkey ancestor, ape, um, and things like that. Um, then you take a step down to family. Um, and this would be like saying Peterbilt 196 um, model 6 with an 18 gauge engine or something like that. Get really specific. Um, and that's going down to the family level. Um, you're getting down to hominids. And these are things that walk upright um, or the large great apes. And then you get down into genus and species. And genus takes it to Peterbilt, this is our uh, Ford F-150 kind of thing. Um, you get down to a really specific um, uh, classification, so homo. Um, and this would be things like homo sapiens, us, um, anything that's classified as a human or a human ancestor. And then you get down into the most exclusive where you've got F-150, Dually, X-Cab, third uh, seat extended edition Lariat XLT. And that's the specific model of the specific truck that's made by a specific company that's a specific model of a specific family kind of thing. Um, and this is one individual species that tells you exactly what you're talking about. Homo sapiens, humans, that's the only thing that has this scientific name. So the farther up you go, the least inclusive you get, or the most inclusive you get, it has more stuff with it. And the farther down you go, the least inclusive you get until you get to having one individual species um, up until a bunch of different in species um, things. So the more uh, in common different animals share, different organisms share with this classification scheme, the more closely you are related to that particular organism. So here's our domains over here. There are three of them. Domain bacteria, domain archaea, and domain eukarya. So all three of these domains um, have more than one kingdom inside of them. Um, or one or more, excuse me. So um, domain eukarya has quite a bunch. Um, animals, kingdom, and plants. Um, domain eukarya, domain um, bacteria. There are tons of different species um, inside of this. Millions in some um, Lots and lots and lots of different species. Now remember, this is like saying planes, trains, and automobiles. There's a lot of different planes, there's a lot of different trains, and there's a lot of different automobiles. So each one of these little branches is going to have more branches onto it that get down to the individual specific type of train, type of plane, type of automobile that we are talking about. So domains are just a very large classification groups for life. If you're a bacteria, you're in the domain bacteria. If you're an archaic organism, you're in the domain archaea. If you are a eukaryotic cell, this could be something like yeast or you or a great blue whale, um, you're going to be classified as the domain eukarya. So here's what's going on here. Domain bacteria and domain archaea are going to be prokaryotic organisms. Now we'll talk about what this means later on, what the differences between the two different cell types are, what's going on. Um, but generally speaking, this means that they lack a nucleus and nu uh, membrane-bound organelles inside of them. They essentially are just one big functioning organelle that can do everything that the cell needs to do inside of it. They are also all unicellular. Um, they can't uh, there are some they might live in colonies, um, little blobs of multiple cells together, but they're all unicellular. They don't need multiple cells around to function. Um, they can live by themselves perfectly fine. Um, so this is domain bacteria down here. This is Helicobacter pylori, the bacteria that causes stomach ulcers, um, and our little archaic organisms over here. These guys are super cool. So our next step up um, would be to start talking about the kingdoms that are found inside the domain Eukarya. So the very first kingdom is Kingdom Protista. You can see this here in orange. Now Kingdom Protista is going to contain multiple kingdoms inside of it. Protista is kind of a, a, a catch-all for animals that don't really fit the mold 
um, for plants, fungi, or animals. They kind of have characteristics of all three of them. Um, some of them have more than one characteristic of maybe one animal, one fungi, maybe one plant, one fungi. They kind of are somewhere weird, um, but they all have eukaryotic cells, so they're going to be stuck in this domain. So if you're a weird little critter, um, you do something very interesting that's not stereotypical to animals, fungi, or plants, um, you're going to get stuck in Kingdom Protista. So Kingdom Protista is just kind of a catch-all um, for the, the random little guys that aren't, aren't easy to classify, that have weird traits about them. Um, protist can be either unicellular or multicellular, um, and they can either be autotrophs or heterotrophs, um, which means auto, meaning uh, self, troph, meaning feeding, um, which means they can make their own food. They are producers. They are capable um, of producing their own food, either via photosynthesis or chemosynthesis and things like that. And heterotroph over here um, is the other form. We are heterotrophs. Hetero meaning different, troph meaning feeding, so different feeding. Um, they have to eat something for them to get their energy. They can't make it themselves. Um, so we're heterotrophs. We have to eat things, break that stuff down, um, to get the energy in, out of it inside uh, into our bodies to power our cells to function. Kingdom Animalia. So animals, um, are you're probably quite familiar with animals. Um, there are lots of them. Uh, most of them have vertebrates. Um, not all of them do. In fact, the vast majority of animals don't have vertebrates. Um, I bet when you think of an animal, you think of things like fishes and frogs and birds and things like that. Um, but the vast majority of animals include things like bugs, um, little worms and things, which you probably don't think of very much. All animals on the planet are going to be multicellular, and that is a characteristic of animals. We have more than one cell that all works together to make us as an organism function. That's a key characteristic of all animals. And all animals on the planet are heterotrophic. All of us are going to have to eat food by ingestion. There are more than one type of heterotroph, which we'll get into later on. All of us have to eat our food. There's not an animal on the planet that is naturally photosynthetic that is capable of producing food via sunlight, our, photosynthesis, our uh, chemosynthesis, and just sitting there um, and not eating some sort of other nutrient um, source to get the energy that it needs. Kingdom fungi. Um, these guys are nature's decomposers that we talked about earlier. Um, they take things that are dead, um, they take the nutrients that are inside of that dead organism, and then they will break that dead organism down, digest it, um, and put it back inside of the soil um, for plants um, and other things to use the nutrients inside of it instead of it just being trapped in there in a dead body, um, a dead organism. So all those nutrients that are inside of that dead organism are going to be recycled and put back into the environment by our little fungi here. Um, almost all fungi are going to be multicellular. There are some unicellular fungi, yeast is an example, um, and they're all going to be heterotrophic. Fungi are not plants. They are not capable of doing photosynthesis. You have to be green to be able to produce energy via sunlight. These guys can't do that. They're not green. So they have a very interesting style of feeding um, called saprophytic or saprobes. Um, and they kind of eat like spiders. Essentially what they do is they're little, um, they're called hyphae. They kind of look a little bit like roots. They're underneath the ground. Um, they're little hyphae secrete digestive enzymes, which break down stuff in the environment. Um, and then the fungi just kind of sucks back up the juices. Um, very interesting way um, to eat. So they cannot produce food via photosynthesis. Um, they are all heterotrophs. And then our kingdom plantae. These guys are going to be our producers. Um, all plants are multicellular. There are no unicellular plants. Those are algae. Um, and all plants are capable of producing um, energy via photosynthesis. They are autotrophs. Plants don't really eat their food. Um, there are some that supplement their sources of food, uh, nitrogen and things, um, like uh, Venus flytraps. But the uh, Venus flytraps also produce their food um, via photosynthesis. So all plants are capable of producing food uh, via photosynthesis. And that's one of our key characteristics of a plant. So we, all you can see, um, these different characteristics, the ability to produce food with our plant, um, that saprophytic di digestion, uh, multicellular heterotrophs, um, autotrophs and heterotrophs, multicellular, unicellular, all these different characteristics are unique 
for each one of these little kingdoms inside of the domain Eukarya. And that's what gives um, scientists uh, ways to classify different organisms in their different kingdoms based on if they have these traits um, and things like that, what they do, how that organism functions. So let's go ahead and talk about how scientists answer questions, um, how we ask questions, why we ask questions, um, and the type of questions that scientists will ask and answer. So scientists generally ask questions um, about the natural world around them using a process called the scientific method. And this is the um, observe, ask a question, figure out why that question is that way, and report back your findings method. You've probably seen this one a lot. So this is our scientific method. You have lots of different steps that are all going to be um, interconnected that all build on top of one another to allow you to ask and answer successfully um, a scientific-based natural world phenomenon question. So why does this stuff exist? Why do scientists have these um, ways to do things, these scientific methods and things? Well, for one, you want to make sure that you can replicate your experiment. You want to write down every single thing you know about doing your experiment, every single background information that you know about your experiment, because you might need to do it again. Someone else might need to do it again. So um, you also might need to share your results with someone. Someone else might need to do alterations to your experiment. So if you follow a set steps, a set way of asking and answering questions, um, it's very easy to tell someone else how to do this. Oh, follow the same steps I did. And that's why these things exist, just to make it standardized. So right here, we're going to follow our scientific method using rotavirus. Um, little children get this virus a lot. Um, so pretty much what happens is a little kid's going to stick his fingers and stuff in his mouth and nose um, and get this virus on his fingers and hands and get it inside of his mouth, which causes um, disease inside of the baby. There are vaccines for rotavirus, um, and you can get your child vaccinated for rotavirus to prevent this, uh, this infection from occurring. So that is a, uh, an, an observation. That's the very first step of our scientific method. We've observed that rotavirus causes little children to get sick, and we've also observed that the vaccine um, tends to prevent um, children from getting sick. So we've observed that. Well, we want to ask a question. Is the rotavirus vaccine effective? Does it work to prevent rotavirus? Or is there something else that's causing these children to not get uh, rotavirus once they've been vaccinated? So they get vaccinated, they don't get rotavirus. Is it the vaccine that's causing them to not get sick? Or is it just something else? Are they getting too old? Um, is it some sort of environmental or genetic condition? What is it? So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to ask the question, is the rotavirus vaccine effective? And that's our second step here. To ask a question, make our observation, the rotavirus exists when they get a vaccine, and they seem to not get sick anymore. Our question is, is the rotavirus vaccine effective? Well, our next step of the scientific method is going to be something you can do if you have the ability to do so. Consulting prior knowledge. You're going to go on the uh, internet and you're going to do a scientific literature search um, to ask these types of questions to see if anybody has researched the rotavirus vaccine um, in anything at all. Because you may find out that someone has already done um, the research for you. They may have asked and at answered the same question. You may also find out that someone's asked a very similar type question, or maybe they did part one of your experiment and you need part three and four done, um, to, uh, two and three and four to finish your experiment, and you can skip part one because someone else has already done it or they um, already um, figured out how to do it and things like that. So consulting knowledge that other people have uh, published that's been peer-reviewed is very useful because you may save yourself a lot of time and a lot of headache um, and get some very useful tips and tricks before your own experiment. Now, once you've done that, um, you're going to formulate a hypothesis. You often hear the statement, this is an if-then question, but it's more like a statement. It's a, a, a tentative explanation to uh, explain what something, why something is, is happening. So, the vaccine will stimulate an immune response and will therefore be associated with reduced illness of the rotavirus. 
I have made the statement that the vaccine is what is causing children to not get sick with rotavirus. Once they are immunized, they will not get sick anymore, and the cause of that is the vaccine. That is my statement. That is my hypothesis. That is what I am going to test. The vaccine is effective, and that is what my statement um, of what I think this outcome is going to be. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a prediction. If the vaccine is effective, then vaccinated children should indeed have a lower infection rate in rotavirus compared to children that receive a placebo vaccine, a fake vaccine. And that would make perfect sense. Um, if you have a vaccine that works and a vaccine that's essentially just sugar water um, and you give it to 100 children, um, the children that are vaccinated, you should see a drastic difference from the children that are vaccinated um, that get sick versus the children that are not vaccinated and get sick. One should be significantly higher than the other if it really is the vaccine that is causing these children to not get sick. And then you have to design your experiment. Now in this case, researchers took 100 healthy children, broke them into three different groups where they have a control group that doesn't get any vaccines at all, um, into one of three treatment groups where they're going to get probably a vaccine, a half a dose of vaccine, and then a placebo group and things like that to test to see which groups have the um, highest infection rates. After the experiment has been carried out, you're going to take your um, results and you're going to start to go over those results. You're going to look at what, uh, you, what you collected to see how many children were sick um, to see what groups had the most sicknesses and things like that. You can also consult prior knowledge to see if your results um, are similar to the results that you may have previously found. And then once you've done that and you've shown, you've, uh, uh, you've read your data, you've collected your data, you've read it properly, you've interpreted it correctly, you can go, oh, I do indeed see that my group here of children that were vaccinated for uh, rotavirus only one of them out of the 50 got sick, but the non-vaccinated group of 50 and our um, placebo our group, but uh, 30, 40 of them got sick in each one. So the only possible explanation for the drastic difference between the infection rates of the three is the vaccine that's causing the immune system to be stimulated, which causes a reduced likelihood of becoming sick. So once you've done all of this stuff, you draw on your conclusions, you will publish your paper or attempt to get it published in a uh, um, scientific journal. But before that happens, it's going to have to go through the peer review process. And what this is, is a bunch of scientists that are in the field of study that you can work in, in this case they study childhood diseases, are going to tear your paper apart. They're going to look at everything you've written, every word you did, every study you conducted, to make sure that it actually meets up to scientific rigor standards. You did it properly. You didn't just look at five kids that were uh, your next door neighbors um, and see if they've been vaccinated or not. You actually did a proper experiment to truly give um, a good sample, a good representation um, of how this vaccine works in the real world um, and not in a very limited five or six uh, uh, test subject capacity. So we've already walked through how the scientific method works. Um, and these are a little more explanations um, of how this works. So good experiments have a couple of crucial things in common with them. Good experiments include a large sample size. Sample size is going to be the numbers of subjects that are going to be tested during the experiment. If I say that Pepsi is the best uh, soda on the planet, and I grab Pepsi and RC off the shelf, and those are the only two sodas that you get to test. If Pepsi wins 95% of the time, that is not a really good representation that Pepsi is the best uh, soda on the planet. It just says that soda Pepsi is the best soda when compared to RC. So a best, better way to design that would be to take Pepsi, RC, and all the rest of the different types of sodas on the shelf so you have a large sample. Another way to explain this one would be if I want to determine the average heights of humans. Um, if I walk into one uh, classroom in one high school, 
on in Tennessee and measure all of the students in there, that's not going to be a really good example or good representation of what the average American city, the American town is going to look like. That's going to be 20 high school students um, in Tennessee somewhere. A better way to do this would be to go to the airport and measure 500, 600 people that come in and out going from the international departures and going lanes because you'll get a nice sample of people um, all across the world. And that would be a much better way to do that. So you want to make sure that you have an appropriate sample size to give um, a, a good statement uh, that's got a lot of weight behind it as to, yes, my results are valid. My sample of 1,000 people from the airport at the international comings and going late uh, lanes from all different types of backgrounds from all different countries is way more likely to be accurate in average human heights um, than my sample at the high school in, uh, of 20 students in uh, Tennessee. So that's what the sample size is. At one point in time, though, the sample size becomes slightly redundant. 10,000 people is pretty much going to be the same as a million people, and a million people is pretty much going to be the same as a, a 2 million, 3 million, 5 million, 6 million people. At one point in time, you kind of run into the battle of diminishing returns thing. Good uh, experiments are also how going to have an independent and a dependent variable. Now, the independent variable is going to be what you test. So if you're testing to see if water is going to be better to water plants with, um, or so, excuse me, if soda is going to be better to water plants with than plants, they grow faster if you use soda, um, what you're going to be testing is the soda, and that's going to be the independent variable. That's going to be changed. That's going to be different from the other plants that get water. Now what's going to be measured in this experiment is going to be the height of the plant and that's going to be determined or uh, classified as the dependent variable. The independent variable, the water and the soda, it's going to be changed, is going to influence the dependent variable, which is what you're measuring, how tall that plant grows. Water is probably going to make the plant grow higher, um, so you will measure that. So more water, more plant height. More soda, less plant height. And that's how those two things are interconnected. Most good experiments will also have something called a standardized variable. And this is going to be stuff that's going to be the same between these two variables, these two groups that you're testing here, the water group of plants and the soda group of plants. Um, and this would be things like the plants, pots that you're using to make sure they're all the same size from the same manufacturer. You want to make sure that you have the same potting soil and all the plants. So um, if one grows taller than the other, it's not because you had miracle grow in one and then uh, just garden dirt in the other. I mean, the miracle grow caused the other one to grow faster. You want to make sure that they all get the same type of nutrients. They all get the same type of light. They're all in the same um, environment with heat and air and things like that. Um, so you can truly say that it was the soda that caused the plants to not grow very high and not, oh, it was the soil that caused the plants not to grow well. So you want to make sure that it is actually the independent variable that is causing the change in the dependent variable that you're seeing. And you do all that by standardizing everything else that you can possibly control about your experiments, making sure everybody has the same food, the same nutrients, the same environment, and that they're all exposed to the same types of test conditions. And then a lot of good experiments will also have a control. And this is going to be a group of plants that you just set, you pot them once in the same potting soil, the same pots, you put them in the same room, same light, and you just give them water. And that's going to be go just to show that, hey, this is what a plant does underneath our test conditions um, when we don't do anything with it other than just give it exactly what it needs to stay alive. We're not giving it any soda, we're not giving it more water, we're not giving it less water, we're giving it the exact amount that it needs. Um, that most plants need, and this is what a plant would look like under healthy, normal conditions. If our plant is taller, you can say, oh, the sugar made it grow more. If it's shorter than those, you can say the sugar stunted its growth. And that control allows you to see what would really happen um, if you were not messing up the experiment, if you weren't playing with the things inside of it, if you weren't uh, manipulating the factors inside. What a non-manipulated plant would do um, just to be able to grow under those conditions. So controls are very useful to see what would happen to uh, something without any influences from you. So you can go over these if you'd like to. Um, here's the scientific method talking about the um, 
dose of the vaccines, the rotavirus that we went over earlier, um, and where you would find the independent, dependent, and standardized variable um, for each one of those examples. So once you've gotten all of your data, you're going to analyze that data using statistical analysis, some different types of tests, uh, student t-test, different types of tests, um, to figure out if there is really a difference between groups of uh, your controls, your groups of test uh, plants and test groups of test things. So you want to be able to show that, yes, the differences between the two groups are not just caused by pure random chance. So in our experiment here, um, what they did was they're looking at the percentage of tumors that arise in mice. And they had mice that were fed quite a lot of sugar, male rats and female rats. You can see here ones that were fed saccharin and ones that were fed controls, just ones that were fed normal old um, uh, uh, rat food, normal old, uh, just normal seeds, I suppose. So what you see here is that you see 19% of the rats that were fed sugar um, that are parent that are males, and 27% of the male rats um, that are their offspring developed tumors when fed a high saccharin diet, a high sugar diet. Whereas only 3% of the parent offspring are parent rats, and 0% of the offspring developed um, cancer when not fed a sugar diet. The same thing stood true over here for the females. Now, what you can see here is that there's a drastic difference between our males um, developing cancer with saccharin and non-saccharin. Females, it doesn't seem to matter too terribly much, but for the males, there's a drastic difference. 27 and 0 is a massive difference. 19 and 3 is also a massive difference. So over here, your statistical test would probably show that if a number, uh, you do, you have to set your numbers and things like that. Different tests have different numbers um, that they spit out. But if the number that the test spits out is, certain, is higher than a certain number, you can say that this difference right here is caused by the saccharin diet and not just the fact that cancer arises in mice from time to time or rats from time to time and not just the fact that cancer exists. Now over here, um, you can see it as well, 27 and 0, drastic difference. Um, the saccharin obviously influences the uh, likelihood of a rat developing cancer. Um, it's very clear to see. Um, the statistical test would show that as well. Now over here in our females, 4 and 0, that's not that big of a difference. You look over here, three of the control group of the males developed cancer, even though they weren't fed saccharin. Three and four is even less of a difference. So there's a decent chance that these mice developed cancer simply because cancer exists. It's not necessarily because of the saccharin. You can't guarantee that the saccharin in females is what causes them to develop cancer because it easily could have been random cancer, um, random genetic cancers, random other types of cancers that just happened inside of these rats. You can't say that this difference is caused by saccharin, whereas over here, it's very easy to see the difference is obviously caused by saccharin. Now, statistical analysis sh would show that these two numbers, this difference is statistically significant. Yes, 4 and 0 is different. It is different. That is a 100% fact. 3 and 4 is also different. But it is not statistically significant. You can't say that the saccharin caused the cancer. It could have been easily explained by the fact that cancer exists. Now, another thing that you need to keep in mind as we move forward in this class is that I'm going to be using the word theory a lot. Scientific theories, what they mean, um, is a different word in the word uh, in the science realm than it is in just the normal word theory. If someone says, I have a theory, you're probably going to go, oh, great, and now I'm going to hear about how the aliens came down and abducted Elvis and took him back to their mothership. That's not what it means in science. In science, the word theory is kind of like the holy grail of, uh, of usefulness. Um, a theory is all of the scientific facts and all of the scientific laws put together in one big giant book. I like to explain theories a lot like cookbooks. You've got 
a cookbook. And that cookbook is going to contain individual recipes on how to make individual dishes. It may contain a couple of little things of information on how your oven works, how to preheat, what the different settings of the ovens are, and things like that. Each individual recipe is going to be a scientific law in my metaphor. Each individual instruction on how to power your oven or different mixers and things like that is going to be a scientific fact. All of these scientific facts, all of these scientific laws, all the different cooking things, everything we know about bacteria, how they transmit, how they uh, uh, reproduce, how they uh, function, how they make energy, all of those different things that we know about cooking, um, about bacteria, are all going to be crammed together in one giant book called The Theory of Cooking or The Theory of Bacteria. So our cookbook it contains all of the um, not recipes, all of our how our oven works. You put them all together in one book, and that's the theory of cooking. You open it up, it's going to tell you everything you could ever want to know about cooking. Um, so that's what the word theory means in science. So let's go down to talk about these. Germ theory. This is going to be how bacteria um, transmit from uh, place to place, that they make you sick, how they make you sick. If you open up the big book of germ theory, you will find every scientific fact known about bacteria, every scientific law about how they transmit, how they reproduce, how their genetics work, all of that stuff crammed together in one big collective book is called the germ theory. Everything you ever want to know about bacteria is there. Evolution's the same thing. Um, we, how species uh, adapt, how the environment causes them to adapt, what types of speciation, what is speciation. Everything we know about how animals evolve, how they work, how they uh, speciate is going to be collectively included in the theory of evolution. Gravity is the same way. Everything we know about how the universe works, how gravity works, how uh, um, all of those different forces interact with one another is going to be contained within the theory of of gravity. Music is also a theory, um, which is another interesting one. All of the facts about how sound waves work and things like that. So in science, a theory is essentially winning a Nobel Prize. Um, if something becomes a theory, um, it is going to be given uh, the highest status that something, a, a thought or an idea can be giving, uh, given in science. Another good theory also allows you to make um, predictions. Good theories allow you to say um, according to this theory, this should happen. This should exist. This type of thing should exist. This type of relationship should be found. This should happen if this occurs. In the theory of evolution and germ theory and gravitational theory, all work out that way. The gravitational theory, theory states that if something is heavier than air or if it's subject to a gravitational force that's heavier than it, stronger than it, it will fall. And if you drop something off the desk, it will fall. Evolution occurs the same way. Speciation, um, if an animal is separated due to genetic factors, they will evolve separately. Germ theory, if you come in contact with a bacteria that's highly pathogenic, you're going to get sick. Um, and the really big ones here for evolution are you can predict that different types of species exist um, based on how they look. So you can take this hawk moth here. They have a very long proboscis. Um, you can say that long proboscis and hawk moths is going to be used to fertilize plants to get the nectar, or excuse me, to get the nectar from uh, long stemmed plants. That's what these moths feed on, our plant nectar. They're going to get this nectar um, from these really long plants because they have a really long nose. Well, lo and behold, you go out and look, and you do find these really long plants with these really long tubes with nectar at the bottom. And that's what that really long proboscis from that hawk moth is used for. And you can predict how animals will function or um, will, will, will do based on how they're put together. So good theories allow you to make predictions, which then come true. Theories also can uh, become falsifiable. If a theory does not hold up to scientific um, testing to um, come over and over and over, um, eventually it will go away. Um, all theories that are withstanding today could potentially be proven wrong. They only stay around because they keep being uh, uh, tested and observed over and over and over again. If my theory states that I turn my oven on to 350 degrees and every single time it heats up to 350 degrees, that's probably a pretty good theory. 
If the theory of evolution states that every time this type of environmental condition occurs, animals react this way, and they all do, um, or the theory of gravity states that if everything falls off, uh, that everything will fall to the ground uh, subject to gravitate gravity, um, and then everything does, it's probably a pretty good theory. Now, if we keep testing and dropping things and they don't fall, they float, something's wrong with our theory, which means our theory could potentially be proven falsifiable. It could be get proven wrong, um, which means we get rid of it and we replace it with something else. Now, there are unfortunately limits to science, things that science can and can't answer, and unfortunately science can't answer every single question out there. And the reasons why are very uh, broad and uh, very different. There are multiple interpretations of the same data sets. Now, you have probably all seen someone reads the same study as you, and you both get two totally different outcomes from the same study. That happens in science, too. Two experts can disagree on the same thing. Um, they may share 90 to 95% of the information together that they agree on, but the last 5 10%, they're just not going to come to uh, agreement on, um, and that's going to limit uh, scientific inquiry. If I don't agree with you and you don't agree with me, we're probably not going to work together to advance science. People can misinterpret what they see or their results all the time, and this happens a lot. Um, some people don't know what they're looking at when they see animals out in nature and they misinterpret it as a different species, um, or they see something happen underneath a microscope or in their lab, um, and they think it happens for a different reason than what it's really happening. And they report that as an incorrect uh, statement. It's not necessarily their, their fault. It's just they misinterpreted what they saw or what they observed, what they heard. Um, and sometimes that can happen with the results as well. Um, scientists uh, or other people um, can misinterpret the results of their studies um, and misinterpret um, what the, the actual study is saying and, mis and report uh, different outcomes um, than what they actually observed. Now sometimes, this one gets a little scary, if something is scary to the population as a whole, it tends to have a lot of, uh, of pushback when science um, comes up or, or, or advances um, a particular statement. So science comes out and says the uh, um, MMR vaccine is highly effective, 99.9% .9 effective um, in treating uh, the MMR uh, classifications of diseases. Everyone needs to have this. Um, it's unexpected. Um, people start pushing back on it, and it's going to cause a, a lot of, of hard times for scientists going forward. Um, when people start pushing back against mandatory vaccines and things like that. Um, and then the last one is kind of the, uh, the most simplistic to understand is science is kind of limited um, to understanding the world around it, the natural world. Um, science can't really investigate if ghosts are real or not. Um, no one's ever seen a ghost. No one's ever proven that a ghost exists. So how can I test if something exists that I don't know it's really there or not? Um, no one's ever proven that the quote-unquote tools they use to detect get ghost um, work, and they're actually detecting a ghost and not just some sort of other random thing that's happening. So those tools aren't necessarily useful either. Um, so science cannot investigate um, life after death. We can't test that. You can't test for some sort of supernatural being. You can't prove that ghosts exist. Um, science is limited um, to testing things around in the natural world that are physically observable, physically testable, physically touchable for the most part kind of thing. So science cannot answer every single question on the planet simply because there's no real way to investigate things like is there life after death um, really? Um, you can't kill somebody and then bring them back um, where we don't have the technology to do that yet. Um, we don't have the technology to detect ghosts or, and, and things like that. So it's very difficult to um, test for something if you don't have um, real proof that it exists. Um, and then our last one is going to be we are limited in our technology. Um, at one point in time, microscopes didn't exist, so people didn't know that there were bacteria and small little microscopic organisms out there in the world. As technology advanced and microscopes became a thing, they realized that, oh, there are tons of little tiny organisms out there that we can't see. So... What's going to happen 
um, in the future. Who knows what our technology will um, develop 200, 300, 400, even 20, 30 years from now. We may have the ability to fly to Pluto, to fly to Mars, to leave our solar system, to interdimensional uh, travel. Who knows um, what could be discovered um, in the future of science. Um, but at the moment, we are limited by our technology. We don't have the ability to fly out of our universe yet on a spaceship, but at one point in time, we might. We might. Um, so we have to work within the practical technology that we have today. So guys, the last little bit of this PowerPoint is going to be talking about the uh, um, uh, pictures in this PowerPoint. If you would like to go over it, um, you're more than welcome to. If not, um, if you have any questions at all about this PowerPoint, please feel free to email me. Um, if not, I hope you have a great rest of the day.